Last week we saw this uh, epic confrontation between Satan and Jesus. Remember that? Jesus was led out into the wilderness. He's, he's baptized. He's led out into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit. So we saw the Holy Spirit at his baptism. We saw the Holy Spirit bringing him out into the wilderness. And he's fasting there uh, for quite a period of time. And while he's weak and uh, physically weak, the, Satan comes to try to offer him an easy way out. And uh, Satan uh, tries to, to warp and change things around uh, the scripture. He misinterprets it, brings it in the wrong context. But Jesus is always answering with scripture. And Jesus, of course, uh, just like us, but without sin, God in flesh coming down. He did not stumble. He kept his mission in front of him. And uh, Luke was, again, once again, showing us who is Jesus. Who is Jesus? Well, he's one who doesn't crumble, and he didn't fall apart when affected by sin. Today's message is going to be very different. We're going to take a look at uh, now the start of Jesus' public ministry. So why are we studying? We started with Matthew, Mark, Luke. What do we say at the very beginning? We're studying the Gospels first because we want to fall in love with Jesus. Because Jesus loves us so much. We see the cross all the time, but we forget about what's all involved there. Jesus loved us so much that he said, I'm going to pay for all your sins. Every single thing that you're ashamed of, every single time you stumbled and fell and you know, we say made a mistake. Uh, every, every bit of darkness, wretchedness inside of us, Jesus said, I'm going to take responsibility for that. I'll pay for your sins on the cross. And so what an amazing uh, love that he's given us. And now we're studying who is Jesus. And it's so easy to make up your own personal Jesus. I call it a pocket deity. You know, uh, a pocket deity is a God you just grab out of your pocket whenever you want a little good luck. You, you put him on a shelf or something or, or uh, hang him on, on a chain around your neck. And the whole point of a pocket deity is this God that you make in your image, instead of us being made in God's image, right? We make this God in our own image. You never notice anything about a pocket deity? He loves everything you love. He hates everything you hate. And he does every, everything you want him to do. Instead of being God who is perfect and holy and says, now I'm calling you to, to repent and change your ways and, and align your mindset with my mindset, instead we say, no, I'd rather make a God that looks like me rather than work on myself to be more like Jesus, right? You ever notice that kind of temptation inside of us? We, we say things like, well, I don't think God would, or I don't think any real God would, instead of going to the Bible, God's love letter, where he's revealed his heart to us so we can know who he is, we kind of just pull stuff out of the air, and God ends up being a lot like us, doesn't he? he? Everything we approve of, he approves of, and the things we really don't like, he really doesn't like, and he's always patting us on the back, telling us how wonderful we are, and we don't have to change a thing, and well, that's a pocket deity. That's not a God of the universe. That's not a king of kings. It's not a God you fall before in front of and say, Lord God, you are wonderful. You are awesome. This is a God who's convenient. Oh, and he's also not real. So he can't help you. But, but we use him as a crutch oftentimes. Uh, today's message, we're going to take a look at why Jesus, listen, why Jesus wouldn't have won any awards for his ability to win friends and influence people. Now, isn't that an important life skill? I think it's an important life skill. You need to work on, on being able to be a friendly person, to, to be interested in other people's lives, to, uh, to, to use your influence hopefully for good. But Jesus would not have won any awards for his ability to win friends and influence people. And actually, the title for today's message is, Jesus would have made a lousy televangelist. <laughs> Jesus would have made a lousy televangelist. And that's, that's really telling one of the things I'm always saying is let's be careful. You know, you've heard of Christianese like, like Chinese and Japanese and, and Christianese. It's, it's a language only Christian people talk. And we use a lot of religious words and spiritual words. And when we start using words that don't look like anything we see in the scriptures, that's a good clue that maybe we're making up our own religion with our own pocket deity and we're not humbling ourselves before the God of the universe. Jesus Christ didn't really care about being convenient for you and I. God, listen, God is inconvenient. Yeah, I mean, you want to lie because 
If you lie about your used car, you're going to get an extra 500 bucks. And here's God saying, you know, that's not right. You can't rip somebody off. Thou shalt not. Okay, okay. Shh, shh, shh. God is inconvenient. He speaks the truth whether we like it or not. Little, little background setting before we get into that, though. Uh, we're going to be looking at the region where Christ grew up around Nazareth. It's called the area of Galilee. Uh, Jesus is a man of Galilee. We're going to be looking at the region where he grew up uh, at the time of Christ. It was ruled by the descendants, by the line of Herod the Great. Herod the Great, remember, was this, was this uh, king who, was, who had embraced Judaism. Uh, he had grown up in the, in the region, but he was a, a client king, or, or you might say a puppet king, underneath the Roman Empire. Remember, Herod the Great had battled the Parthian Empire. And the Parthians were, were kind of ruling over uh, this area of Judea, Galilee, and everything. And then the, the Romans, uh, Herod the Great and the Romans came in. There was several battles back and forth. And finally, the Romans gained control. So when we read our New Testament, we often think, well, that area had been ruled by the Romans for a long time, but it really hadn't. This, this was the, the ragged edge of the Roman Empire, and there was always conflict right here. And so Herod the Great had, it was a big deal in the Roman Empire. He's a wealthy king. He's a powerful king, and he had some of the greatest, grandest building projects in the entire Roman Empire. The port at Caesarea was a, a wonder of the Roman Empire. Uh, several of the cities, he, he, he started the city of Tiberias from scratch, built up a city. And, and so Herod the Great was called the Great not because he was a good person, because he wasn't good, but because he did great building projects, and he, he established his kingdom right here in the middle of two empires. And so... Now Galilee and, and the other regions are being ruled by, by his children, his descendants, but they're ruling underneath the authority of the Roman Empire. And the kings could basically do whatever they wanted as long as they kept the peace because Rome did not like strife. Rome did not like trouble. That's a good way to lose your head. Uh, if the people underneath you are rebelling and you can't deal with it, Rome's not pleased. And maybe the bigger one even yet, you've got to raise the taxes for the Roman Empire. So as long as the king kept the peace and paid the taxes, he could pretty much do whatever he wanted, and Rome did not care. Okay, let's look at Luke chapter 4, verse 14. Luke chapter 4, verse 14. Again, uh, the devil had, had left Jesus because Jesus resisted the temptation, but he left, the Bible says, looking for a more opportune time. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. So we saw the Holy Spirit come on him during his baptism. We saw the Father speaking, this is my Son in whom I am well pleased. We saw the Son, the Holy Spirit, Father, Son, the, the Trinity there. Then we saw the, the Holy Spirit actually leading Christ into a place uh, where, the, where the devil is going to be tempting him, into a wilderness place. And now we see the Holy Spirit leading him back to, his, to the area where he grew up, kind of his hometown in, in his hometown, in the home region where he was from. And news about Jesus began to spread throughout the entire countryside. Now, Galilee, I don't know if you always get this when you're reading your scriptures, but Galilee was not a predominantly Jewish place. You'd think that, that Jerusalem would be the major cosmopolitan center, and it would be during certain times of the year. But actually, this area to the north of Jerusalem had a lot more Roman influence and Greek influence. And this is where... Jesus grew up in. So when people say there's no way Jesus would have spoke Greek, that's ridiculous. Uh, that area was heavily influenced by Greek, and Tiberias is actually a very Roman city, so there was a lot of people speaking Latin in the area too. And this is the area that Jesus grew up in. Uh, so it says that everywhere Jesus went, uh, news about him spread throughout the entire region. Well, if you're trying to do anything of significance, if you're trying to start a business or, or, or start a church or do a ministry, it's probably good when news about what you're doing gets spread throughout the entire region. That's a good start. You, if you want to change the world, right, it helps to be popular. It does. Uh, if you want to, uh, to influence people, if you're a politician, you hope your book sells a lot, right? If, if you've got... Uh, uh, what does the Fox say video that you want 3 million hits on? It helps not to have 2 million hits, but to have 3 million hits. Uh, whatever you want to do, uh, it helps to be popular. It helps to get it out there. You know what I'm talking about. 
But popularity can also be a trap. Did you ever notice that? Ever think about that? When people build you up and make you popular, they have got this expectation on you. You're popular because you're funny. You're popular because you're a great athlete. Or, or you're popular because of what people want you to do for them again and again and again. And so popularity can actually be a trap. And just like Jesus evo uh, evades the traps of Satan, Jesus Christ is not interested in being trapped uh, by this trap, by, he's by being caught by this trap of popularity. Jesus doesn't allow the crowds to decide who he is and who he is going to be. Now, again, Galilee was this very cosmopolitan region, all sorts of people, but Jesus was reaching out. His ministry was to talk to the Jewish people in the area. In the high hills and in the mountains, the people were more traditional, more conservative even than the, Christian, than the Jews in Jerusalem, mostly Jewish. But in the plains, the people came from all over the Roman Empire, and there was also a lot of Samaritans. Remember the Samaritans? Uh, the, the Jews and the Samaritans didn't get along with each other. Samaritans kind of messed up their religion. They were, they were mixed racially, but they were also mixed religiously. And so they, they didn't have the entire Old Testament, and they didn't really understand the Old Testament, but they called themselves followers of the Old Testament God, but they weren't Jewish. And so they didn't like the Jews and the Jews didn't like them. They wouldn't want to walk on the same street. They were always separated. But there were a lot of Jewish people. Uh, I mean, there were a lot of Samaritans in, in Galilee. The people spoke Aramaic. They spoke Hebrew. They spoke Le uh, Greek and, and even Latin in the area. Greek culture had been important from the time of Alexander the Great. So Greek culture had been impressed in this entire region. Uh, when the Parthians came, we always think they're a Persian empire. They are a Hellenized Persian empire. They, they are Greek-influenced Persia that was ruling over. And now the Romans, also heavily influenced by Greece, are, are in the area. So Greek culture is all over, all over the region of Galilee. Herod the Great had built up that region in particular. Uh, there were modern, thriving cities, major building projects. Josephus, now, most modern scholars doubt Josephus on this matter. Josephus claimed that the cities were densely packed in Galilee. This is a metropolitan area. Most scholars do agree that there were more people living in Galilee at the time of Christ than lived there today. Uh, but Josephus says that in Galilee, there were over 204 cities with over 15,000 people. Uh, that would mean Galilee had a much greater population by many factors greater than Rock County. Uh, if his claim is correct, and again, most scholars do doubt it, not all, but most, then the population of Galilee at that time of Christ would be somewhere around 3 million. One low estimate I came across, though, was uh, anywhere from 300,000 on or 400,000. So either way, we are talking, even the low estimates, we're talking a lot more than the Janesville Beloit region. Uh, before I go on, I want to talk about two towns in Galilee that you're going to hear again and again and again, not just today, but as we go through our New Testament, we're going to hear about these places again and again. One is called uh, Capernaum. Capernaum was a smallish town with a uh, strong fishing industry, and it was situated on the Sea of Galilee. It was Jesus' base of operations, so sometimes people think of it. It's like we can say we're, you know, we'd have a sign and say Abraham Lincoln slept in Janesville. Uh, Jesus wasn't, from, he was, remember he was born in Bethlehem. That was his hometown where he was born. <clears throat> he had three hometowns. Uh, but he grew up in Nazareth. But his base of operations was uh, Capernaum, a little bit farther north, uh, before then he went to Jerusalem. And probably that was because Peter's wife's mother lived in Capernaum. The apostle Peter, his mother-in-law, lived there, and they probably used the home and, uh, as a base. And then Nazareth, again, this is, uh, one of Jesus' three hometowns with Bethlehem, Nazareth, Capernaum, uh, was probably even smaller yet, and it was quiet. Nazareth was the kind of place where nothing significant ever seemed to happen. And I got in so much trouble in Japan once when I said that Bethlehem was a small town that was unimportant and nothing seemed to happen, like Shintomura. And somebody from Shintomura was in the church that morning and let me have it because they thought I was saying their town was unimportant. So I'm not going to at all compare Nazareth to Orfordville this morning. Uh, <laughs> like, like most towns and villages in the region, Josephus never even mentions it. The vast majority of towns in the region, uh, in the region are never mentioned. 
Uh, Nazareth was located about 20 miles southwest uh, of Capernaum, but north of uh, Jerusalem. Interesting side note, Nazareth is still around today. <clears throat> In fact, it's hard to, uh, it's, a, it's a small city, and it's hard to uh, excavate all the ancient history because the city sits right on top. Uh, I'm sorry, it's a large city, but it sits right on, it's in a, it's a large city population-wise, but it's small size-wise, unlike Janesville, which is not a large population, but it's very spread out. Uh, Nazareth, this is interesting, is the only city today in the country of Israel that's majority Muslim. They've got the two-thirds of their population is, is Muslim. Now there's, there's a, a, I don't know if it's like Nasser, Lesser Nazareth, but there's another district of Nazareth that's mostly Jewish. But uh, the city proper is two-thirds Muslim, one-third Christian. Isn't that interesting? And they elected a Christian mayor. Uh, so Nazareth is kind of a, a unique town, a uh, unique city in uh, Israel. Uh, another piece of context to keep in mind as Jesus begins his public ministry, Galilee was also known as being a particularly volatile part of the world. Galilee caused trouble for the Roman Empire. Revolts, rebellion came out of Galilee. The people of Galilee were kind of like frontiersmen in, in the United States in that they were very, very independent. They did not want to obey the government. The people were hard to govern. They were rebellious. And the Jews were looking, the Jews in the region were looking for an Old Testament style hero. They were looking for a Joshua. They were looking for a Gideon. They were looking for, for a Deborah or a David or an Elijah to lead them to independence from Rome. They weren't looking for spiritual revival. They were looking for somebody to get the Roman government off their backs, and they believed the Old Testament. They had seen how God had come through for the, 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 the Israelites again and again, and so they were saying, God, you can do it again. And we're waiting for you. Please come. Please send somebody that can drive out these hated foreigners who are imposing their culture on us. <clears throat> they, they didn't like it whatsoever. Uh, as a result... This was kind of a, a time in history where it was like a Messiah machine. It, it, the, everything was just set up properly, so the region was pumping out messiahs again and again, uh, false messiahs, obviously. Uh, messiahs would, uh, would rise up. They would gather a following. Oftentimes, they'd take their followers out into the wilderness. They'd stir up some trouble, usually. Some were peaceful. Some were, were just a, a group of people who would go out into the desert, and, and they would pray and study scriptures but some were not, and they would arm themselves well. Two violent messiahs that are mentioned in the Bible were a lot of people think that Barabbas had been one of these false messiahs. Barabbas was a leader of a rebellion that he was going to try and fight the Roman Empire. And then there's another guy in Acts 21, remember him? He's just called the Egyptian. The Egyptian. In Acts 21, Paul is confronted by this angry mob in Jerusalem and uh, because facing angry crowds was just what Paul did. It was his thing. And uh, a Roman captain of the guard rescues Paul, and then he says to Paul, aren't you uh, that Egyptian that was involved in a rebellion and led 4,000 murderers out into the wilderness? And Paul said, uh, no. And he said, uh, you can be certain I am a Jew of Tarsus. Uh, but there, so these, these two false messiahs that are actually mentioned in Scripture, and then Josephus mentions more. History tells us that there was a lot of false messiahs coming along. Uh, and Josephus actually talks about the Egyptian as well, and he just calls him the Egyptian. We don't know his name today, but isn't that interesting? That you've got the biblical source, and you've got a non-Christian source. Josephus was a Jew, and they're writing, and they both mention this guy who led a rebellion, and his name was, uh, well, he's called the Egyptian, and he was never, uh, he was never uh, killed. That's why the Roman general, uh, the Roman, I'm sorry, captain here, uh, said, aren't you him? Because they were still looking for him. His followers were, were, were attacked, but he apparently escaped. And Josephus said that he uh, tried to use tricks and, and tri appeared to have magic in order to lead the people. And Josephus calls him a false prophet. In fact, Josephus calls all these false messiahs a false prophet, a false prophet. But he was a false prophet who tricked many people. Usually these false prophets, again, they would go out of civilization. It was very symbolic. We're leaving behind the culture into the wilderness and either waiting for a sign from God 
uh, waiting, with, uh, Josephus called them tokens of their salvation. They were waiting for tokens of their salvation, waiting for God to show them something that God's going to free them from the Roman Empire. Some of them would engage in banditry, which is, seems like a very unreligious thing to do, uh, but they would take from the rich and give to the poor, or they started an insurrection against the government proper. Rome is interesting. They were not known for their compassion. The Romans often didn't differentiate between the different peace the groups, the peaceful ones and the violent ones. And so you got let a group of people, a few thousand people out in the wilderness, and you were just going to pray, or you were ar arming them and training them for battle and, or terrorism or whatnot. Uh, the Romans would send out their soldiers, their cavalry and their, and their foot soldiers, and they would kill everyone. And this, Josephus tells us, this happened multiple times. Uh, I think this is the reason why in, in, 70, uh, in the 70s and then in the 130s, I think, there's these massive rebellions in Jerusalem, in Israel, because people are kind of tired of the government going out and killing everybody. But the government did not care to differentiate between the peaceful groups and the violent groups. They just didn't like, they didn't have any constitution saying that you can gather together. There's no protection for free speech. So you got out there, you were a big group of people, Looks like trouble, easiest, way, easiest thing to do, go kill them all. <clears throat> it's in this context then that John the Baptist is coming and then Jesus Christ himself and both of them are gathering large crowds. And John the Baptist was gathering people and baptizing them in the Jordan. Jesus is gathering people and speaking to them like on the Sermon on the Mount. And the people at that time would have understood John the Baptist and Jesus in this context of, is this now the Messiah? Is this, that was the question on everybody's mind because everybody was waiting for God to do something with the Roman Empire. And Jesus differentiates himself from all the other messiahs by not just telling people what they want to hear. Jesus made himself a very difficult person to follow. Uh, they were all waiting for a freedom fighter and not a sin bearer. Remember, they wanted somebody who would set up an earthly kingdom, and Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it was, my followers would fight for me. They'd pull out swords and fight, but they don't, because Jesus was coming to set up a spiritual kingdom. So that's the background now. I want us to look at this. Beginning of Jesus' public ministry, Luke chapter 4, from verse 14. Jesus returned to, I'm uh, going to read again from verse 14. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Holy Spirit, and news about him spread throughout the entire countryside. So that's good, right? He's getting popularity. He was teaching in the synagogues, and everyone praised him, uh, starting out being praised by all. It's, Luke, it's interesting that Luke stresses how positive Christ's initial reception was. At the beginning of his public ministry, it looked like things were going his way, but it doesn't last long. It's not going to last to the end of the chapter. It's only going to last a few sentences. So Jesus comes, and everybody understands, wow, he's got wisdom. He speaks with authority. He's, he's, he's got charisma or whatever. People are coming to hear him speak. And it would have been so easy for him just to say what people want to hear. Never make anybody uncomfortable. Never challenge people. Never upset anybody. Just tell them what they want to hear. And you could be popular, and he could build up a big following. Things could go his way. But let's look now from... From verse 16, he went to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue as was his custom. Now, people, you run into folks all the time, do I have to go to church to be a Christian? The answer is no. You can be saved. Jesus loves you. You can confess your sins and believe in, in, the, in Jesus' cross and take that cross and, and be saved. And, but you know what? You can't be obedient. You can't be honoring God and say, I'm not going to have anything to do. Why do. What's the number one reason most people don't go to church? Well, there's two. One is they don't like the pastors. And the other two is they don't get along with the people. Well, that's two good reasons to go to church. So you can learn to be humble and you can learn to put up with people you don't like. We're supposed to love everybody. So don't use the fact that other people irritate you as a reason not to go to church. That's, God, thank you for providing me this opportunity to be more loving and less self-righteous. How about that? So, so uh, if Jesus went to the synagogue and says it was his practice, people say, Pastor can't teach me anything, right? I mean, we hear this all the time. Pastor can't teach me anything. Do you think anybody was teaching anything to Jesus at the synagogue? 
Christian, as John was saying, means Christ, little Christ, Christ follower. Was that John or Joshua? Uh, one of you guys was saying that, and you were correct. Uh, if we're going to be like Christ, he's laid down this. Remember, he was baptized to set a pattern for righteousness. He didn't need to be baptized the way we do. He's, he gave this pattern of baptism. He gave this pattern of going to worship regularly. Jesus did it. Right? So we ought to, too. And so it says this was his habit. He, it wasn't because all the people liked him. We're going to see that people all talked about him behind his back, well, in front of his face even. The people challenged him. The people didn't like him, but it was his, it was his, his uh, custom to, to go to worship. And uh, he stood up to read because he was recognized as a teacher. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written. And actually, he kind of combines two different places from Isaiah there. Uh, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners and recover sight for the blind to set the oppressed free to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he stops. The next verse he says he rolls up the scroll. In mid-comma, there was no commas back In mid-sentence he stops, he rolls up the scroll, and he sits down. Uh, he hands the scroll to the attendant and sits down. The next part of that sentence says, uh, to, proclaim, to uh, proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of the Lord's vengeance. And he doesn't say that because Jesus Christ is coming twice, the first time to bring this message of salvation, and the second time Jesus is coming again, he's going to bring the wrath of God. God will judge the world, and Jesus knew that. This is before his cross, before his crucifixion, and he stops. He doesn't even finish the sentence because he wasn't coming to bring wrath at that time. The day of God's judgment had not yet arrived. So he stops and said, this is the day of the Lord's favor. Brothers and sisters, today is the day of the Lord's favor. The wrath of God is not here yet. God has not come to judge the world. So today, we're living in the favor of the Lord. And anybody who calls on the name of the Lord can be saved. There's still time to turn to Jesus and get our lives right. And Jesus came to say, I can save you. You're a prisoner of sin. I can save you out of your sins. He came to bring freedom and to, uh, to give sight to the blind. <clears throat> then uh, verse, uh, yeah, verse 20 again. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it uh, back to the attendant, and sat down, because in those days teachers would sit down to teach. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing, which they're not used to hearing people say. And that really had an impact on everybody in the synagogue. He sat down with authority. He read the scriptures with authority, and he, and he was basically saying these verses that the prophet Isaiah proclaimed, he prophesied about, it's about me. This is a huge claim. He's saying, I am the fulfillment of this prophecy. Verse 22, all spoke well of him, at least at first. And they were amazed at his gracious words that they came from his lips. And then people started to ask, wait, isn't he Joseph's son, the carpenter? They asked. And now Jesus does something interesting. Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me, Preposition, heal yourself, which the people do say that to Jesus. And you will tell me, Do you hear in, uh, do here in your hometown what we've heard that you did in Capernaum? So the people are saying, Do all those miracles for us that you did in the other city. Uh, there, there are people are like this. All right. Do some miracles. Do, show us some special effects. Do, do, a, some, do something flashy. Truly I tell you, Jesus continued, prophets are not accepted in their hometowns. I, you know, and part of your heart is breaking. Jesus, they like you. Jesus, everybody found after you, but he understood their hearts. He understood their hearts. And that's why he's saying this difficult, challenging message. Isn't this int Did you notice that when we're reading through here? They're liking him. He's popular. They're raving on him. And now he's challenging them. And what happens when you challenge people? A lot of people get up and leave the church, right? A lot of people say, well, I don't want any part of this. I don't want a religion that challenges me. I want my pocket God. I want a convenient God. I want a God who will tell me, oh, you're so wonderful, you don't have to change a thing. <coughs> <coughs> Jesus loves people too much to lie to them. Amen? Amen? So verse 25 here, I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time. He's talking about this story that, about Elijah the prophet when he blessed a widow. He said, I assure you there are many widows 
in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut up for three and a half years, there was no rain, and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet, Elijah was not sent to one of the widows of Israel, but to a widow in Zephyrath, Zarephath in the region of Sidon. So it's, it's in the north where the Canaanites are, where the Phoenicians are. And there were many in Israel with uh, uh, leprosy in the time of Elisha. Elisha came after Elijah, the prophet. Yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman, the Syrian. Jewish people did not like foreigners. And they're trying to build Jesus up. And Jesus says, you know what? You guys are going to turn on me. And you know what else? And he talks about two times in the Old Testament where God blessed Gentiles instead of Jewish people. So here is God in the flesh standing before them, bringing them a message they don't want to hear. So you know what they did? They fell down on their knees in repentance, and they wept and said, Sorry, Jesus. We were filled with our own... Oh, wait, wrong translation. Verse, verse 28, Jesus preaches them this message. Jesus himself, all the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. Man, that popularity disappeared quick, didn't it? Say, say, say something that's challenging. Say something that people don't want to hear. Suddenly, he's no longer popular. It gets worse than that. They got up, drove him out of town. That's a bad day. I think some of you know that one time in the James Le Gazette, they published a letter that said, Pastor Dan is what's wrong with this world, right? Uh, or Pastor Dan hates people was another one. I've never had people drive me out of Janesville. I love Janesville. I would probably cry, <laughs> literally. Uh, they got up and they drove him out of town and took him to the brow of the hill on which the, t uh, the city was built in order to throw him off the cliff. That's a pretty harsh reaction. <laughs> they didn't like what he had to say. Now, today, usually people don't you know, grab you to throw you off a cliff. Thank goodness we don't have any cliffs around here. But people can really, really hurt you verbally, can't they? And they just, they'll just totally dismiss you if you ever say, well, God says, and they say, I don't care what God, you know, and, and there's a lot, of, a lot of anger can come with that. But Jesus, and this is a mir 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 miraculously, he walked right through the crowd and went on his way, and they, they couldn't do anything. He just, that was uh, God, God, God. Uh, bringing Jesus, because it wasn't his time to die, right? He was going to die on the cross for our sins. It was not his time. And so he was removed from that situation. Jesus started out popular. And if you or I was in his place, we may have figured out a way that he could have stayed popular. For one, he didn't have to lead with the whole Gentile stuff, did he? He could have instead said, wow, you people are religious aren't you you're so wonderful and you're children of Abraham God really loves you keep up the good work and the people would have ate it up patting them on the back giving them encouragement everybody likes encouragement you know what do we say at foundation nobody can have too much encouragement I believe that but it's got to be honest and, and Jesus Christ was not gonna lie to them just so they wouldn't try to throw him off a cliff uh, if Jesus was willing to let the crowds define him into a pocket deity, he would have been fine. Popularity was going to be a trap for Jesus. Maybe Satan is back tempting him again. The Bible doesn't say that Satan was there, so we don't know. But the Bible said he would come at a more opportune time. When he was struggling out in the wilderness, he defeated Satan. But now there's all this adulation. People are saying, the whole region, people are saying, wow, he's a wonderful teacher. All he has to do is say what they want to hear, and he can build up a big following. That's a trap. Maybe Satan is back trying to get him from a different angle. If Jesus would have allowed the crowd to define who he was, they would have accepted him as a great teacher. Or he could have probably rallied a big group. He could have been a freedom fighter, and he could have gone to war with Rome. He had popularity. The people were impressed. They thought he was authoritative. They thought he was intelligent. But Jesus knew that he had come to die for people's sins so that people could have peace with God, so that people could be in heaven for eternity. And he wasn't going to sell out for some second-rate mission. So Jesus does something unpopular. 
He tells them, you guys are going to miss God's blessing because you lack faith. And these wonderful religious people, again, probably very proud of themselves, respond by trying to kill him. Doesn't seem very religious to me. Uh, again, I think that was probably a bad day for Jesus. It was probably difficult emotionally. This was his hometown. He probably knew a lot of people in that synagogue who grew up around him. I'm sure it broke his mama's heart because she was so proud of him when everybody's cheering for her baby boy, right? And now, boy, it probably hurt him to see his mom hurt. All he had to do was say what the people wanted to hear. All he had to do was butter them up. That's what politicians do, right, all the time? And, and pre preachers do it too. Bob, you are wonderful. That's an excellent comment. And all they had to do was butter him up, and the people would have followed him. But Jesus knew his mission was too important to sell out. He loved people too much to lie to them and to hide the truth. Brothers and sisters, I'm not talking about just Jesus today, am I? I'm talking about you and I as we try to follow Jesus. Do we love people? Do we love God enough to speak the truth? Are we afraid of people disliking us because we bring a hard message? As long as you or I tell people what they want us to say, they'll accept us. You know, the world today in the United States is kind of running away from Jesus, right? But if we kind of change it, maybe ignore chunks of the Bible, alter this, alter that, hopefully they'll still accept us. We can try to do everything we can do to get people's approval. I want God's approval on what we say here. Don't you? We want God to say, good job. I know it's hard sometimes when people don't like you. Jesus says, trust me, I really know. Right? He knows. If we tell people what their itching ears want to hear, you won't have to face rejection. Maybe even as you're buttering them up, they're going to turn around and butter you up and tell you, oh, you're such a wonderful speaker. You're such a wonderful person. And here's the big one. This is a trap. You're not like those other Christians. Oh, yes, I'm glad that you noticed that I'm different and I'm more mature by the And so we chuck our fellow brothers and sisters underneath the bus, and, and then the bus backs up and, and then goes forward, and then backs up again, all because we want people who don't really like Jesus anyways to say, I approve of you. Like, you're a good puppy. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you know? Right? Brothers and sisters, let's live for the approval of heaven instead of the approval of people who don't read the Bible, don't love God, and really just want us to go in that corner, Christian, sit down and shut up because I don't care to hear what you have to say. And I've got to decide, is the cross of Jesus Christ worth holding up? That he loved us enough to die for us? And everybody can, I don't care what religion you are, I, what you, you start off, you know, what you become is important. I don't care what nationality you are, what race you are. I don't care what kind of sin you've got. We've all got sin. Come to Jesus, and he will forgive. And do we love people enough to tell people, Jesus died for your sins, but he rose again. And everyone who puts their faith in him can go to heaven, can, can have this forgiveness. Do we love God enough that we're not trying to be quiet about the parts of his love letter we don't like? God loved us enough to do this, loved us enough to go to the cross, and then we're so afraid of other people that we get embarrassed about the one who loves us more than anybody. Come on, guys. Come on. All we have to do is throw fellow Christians underneath the bus, tell people what they want to hear, and everybody's going to say, good job. Give us a pat on the back. All we have to do is not, it's simple. Brothers and sisters, all you have to do is not care about lost souls, and really not give a rip what God has to say. Kind of simple, right? <clears throat> the people in Nazareth were impressed with Jesus, but he reminds them of these two Old Testament stories about Gentiles being blessed, and they blew up. He hit on a social issue. He touched a nerve. Uh, and even though what he taught was true, the people couldn't, they wouldn't hear it. Anger made them unable to hear from God. Does that ever happen to you and I? Anger makes us unable to hear from God. How about when we're angry with God because our life's not going the way we wanted it to? Anger can make us numb to the voice of God. 
you know, I think I mixed my metaphors there. But anyways, anger can make you numb to the touch of God and deaf to the voice of God. How about that? Did that work better? Amen. Amen. Yeah, when we're, when we're all bent out of shape, when you're bent out of shape, it's like, you ever have a muscle cramp? When you're bent out of shape, it's like a brain cramp. When, you, when you're, uh, you're not thinking. It's true for me, it's true for you, it's true for all of us. Brain cramps don't help you think. And being angry with God puts us in a place where it's hard to hear his voice. It's hard to receive a blessing from God. <clears throat> so even though what Jesus was teaching was true, the people wouldn't hear it because he was t touching on this social issue. They ended up missing Jesus. How tragic is that? They missed blessing. You've got some lousy pastor here this morning, right? Uh, I think we can all agree on that. But they had Jesus Christ. That's God incarnate, love incarnate, right in their presence. They had God right in their synagogue, and they missed it because he said something they didn't like, and they got angry. Social issues, moral issues, cause people to choose against Jesus all the time, and it happens today, people, as well. And as we saw in Matthew 19, when we were back in the book of Matthew, that when Jesus speaks out against divorce, now divorce is a touchy issue, right? Some churches won't even mention that divorce is a sin because half their population is divorced. Well, listen, we love everybody. We want everybody in, but that doesn't mean we say it's okay. The Bible says God hates divorce. Divorce is not God's plan. God's plan in marriage is for it to last. God, that's what God decided. Now, if you've gone through a hard time, you're divorced, we love you, we want to have, have you here, we work together, you know, I'm not perfect, you're not perfect, right? We're all not perfect. But that doesn't mean that we just, and again, I'm not pointing fingers at any churches, but some churches will not talk about divorce because they don't want to offend anybody. Well, no. We have to talk about what the Bible says, right? This is the word of God. But, but even Jesus' own disciples, <coughs> Peter and, <clears throat> and Matthew and those guys, <clears throat> when Jesus first talks about divorce, remember what they said? They said, well, if that's the case, it's better not to get married. The people who were traveling with Jesus didn't like what he said about divorce. So why do you think it'd be easy message to hear today? Sometimes God tells us things that are not convenient. Sometimes God tells us things that are difficult. But you know what? When we come to him in faith, we say, praise God. Thank you, God that you don't leave me in my self-deception. Thank you, God, that you're still working on me, that you don't give up on me. I've got this bad attitude and that bad attitude, but you don't give up on your children. And God didn't give up on the disciples, and guess what? They're later preaching the same message Jesus preached. Their first reaction was not good. Well, if that's the case, better not to get married. That's not the heart of somebody who's listening to Jesus, right? They're, they're fed up with Jesus at that point. But uh, they stuck with him. They stuck with him. And, and God changed them, and the Holy Spirit came into their lives, and they became new people. Uh, and then in John chapter 6, John chapter 6, Jesus has huge crowds around them, huge crowds. And he basically tells them, you're never going to be good enough to please God. This is offensive. That's why the cross is offensive. The cross is pretty much a sign in history that says, you're not good enough. If you were good enough, Jesus wouldn't need to die on the cross. If we could just go to heaven by being good, why would he die on the cross? So Jesus tells them, Jesus tells the crowds, you're never going to be good enough to please God that they have to trust Jesus for salvation, that he's going to offer up his body and his blood for them, and they have to take his body and his blood. They have to take his sacrifice. And that's not what the crowds wanted. How to win friends and influence people? Jesus failed. He had huge crowds, and he said what they didn't want to hear. He didn't tell them, oh, you're so wonderful. Keep at it. God loves you guys. Just keep the same. Don't change a thing, sister. Don't change a thing, brother. He didn't say that. He says, you guys need help. You guys need my sacrifice for your sins. And the Bible says that at that time, the crowd started to leave him. In huge drugs. To the point, the Bible says that many people stopped following. To the point that Jesus talks to his inner circle, his core, and he says, you guys going to leave too? Do you think that, I mean, Jesus was God flesh, but he still had a heart. And when all the people start leaving, he turns to his disciples and says, what, are you guys going to leave too? And, and, 
and his disciples, but unlike the people who would leave Jesus, even though he said something different, his disciples said, Lord, to whom else should we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and we know that you are the Holy One of God. When you know that Jesus is the Holy One of God, when you know that Jesus brings eternal life, then you're not going to walk away because he says things that are inconvenient, contrary to your culture, things you don't like. When you know who Jesus is, you're not going to walk away because he doesn't tickle your ears and keep telling you what you want to hear. And that's the difference, brothers and sisters, listen, that's the difference between being just one of the crowd and one of the family. The crowd leaves Jesus when he steps on their toes, but true disciples know deep down inside that even if the message hurts, it's good for them. That even if the message hurts, it's from God. And if they left the teachings of Christ, where else are they going to go? Because here's where the words of life are. Brothers and sisters, this is a hard teaching. I often, this is the honest truth, during the week, I often hope, I hope next week I can give a nice, fun message because I like to be liked. But I'm just going to preach what comes next, right? I want to preach the truth. And this is another hard message. And we weren't called to be liked, Dan. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm listening. We weren't called to be liked. We, weren't, we were called to love other people even if they don't like us. Did you catch that? Are you a Christian? You're called to love people even if they don't like you. That's hard. Forgive people again and again and again. The Bible says, bless the people who are cursing you. Well, that beep 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 pastor, that beep 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 church. I, don't spend too much time filling in the blanks. It's not <laughs> edifying. Uh, when people are saying bad things about you, praying, Lord, please bless them. God, I just want them to be blessed. I want them to know you, God, and know your goodness and, and to see just a glimpse of how wonderful you are. We're not called to be popular. We're called to love people and to love God and to speak the truth. Even if people hear what you say and say, you know what, I'd like to talk, toss you off a cliff uh, or, or just treat us brutally with words, you don't have the right when you, when you became a believer, guess what? You were bought with the blood of Jesus Christ. What does that mean? God owns you. What does that mean? You gave up a lot of your rights. The right to hold a grudge, you gave it up. The right to be ticked off at the world and to be ticked off at people who speak badly about you, you gave it up. So, so when churches are going around and around, we hate people, and all, they're doing it wrong. Okay? You gave up that right. Jesus Christ loves you, and he also loves those people who are ticked off at you. How dare you dislike somebody that Jesus Christ died for? So we have a choice to be like Jesus and speak God's truth even when it's not popular, even if people will shake with rage towards us, even if people misunderstand us. No, no, I don't hate you. Please, no. Why do you keep saying I hate you? I don't hate you. And they call your love hate. Or... We can put God first, come what may, let the chips fall wherever. I'm going to put God first. People on Facebook might unfriend me. I'm going to put God first. People might judge me. Put God first. People might misunderstand me. Live for him even, listen, live for him even when the whole community turns on us. Even if the community wanted to run you out of town. Do what's right. It used to be... It was okay just to say, I'm going to do what's right. It's, it's foggy. I don't know what to do. I don't want to do it. I'm going to do what's right. There's, there's a peace in doing your duty. Just do what's right. Do what's good. Because, listen, brothers and sisters, you can't proclaim freedom, freedom for prisoners to people who don't know they're in prison. Can I repeat that? You can't proclaim freedom for prisoners for people who don't know they're in prison. And if we keep telling everybody, no, you're fine, you're fine, that's okay, you're fine, they'll never think, wait a second, I need a savior. I need, some, I need forgiveness. Because Christians in the church are going around telling everybody, we don't want to offend anybody. We just want to tell everybody they're okay. Do you see, this is a trap. And we don't want our backsides to fall into this trap. People who don't know that they're spiritually blind can never cry out in joy and say, I once was lost, 
but now I'm found. I once was blind, but now I see. I was talking to a woman online this week, and uh, she was very, very confident in her own innate goodness. And I tried to go around from a few angles, and she kept trying to tell me that I'm probably a better person than I think I am. Uh, she was adamant that the world was good, too. And I felt like asking you, do you not ever watch the news? But I was less confident in her in a goodness than she was, and I was pretty sure the conversation was going to erupt at that point. So I, I kept bringing the truth, but from different angles. See, she had no need of a savior because she was convinced she was good without God. Uh, she wasn't ready for the gospel. Jesus says in Matthew 9, 11 through 13, when the Pharisees saw this, they said to the disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Why does Jesus hang around with the quote unquote bad people, right? But when Jesus heard this, he said, it is not those who are healthy that need a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. So what's the prerequisite? To getting right with God? Yeah, a sinner. We always think, well, if I'm going to get right with God, I have to be really good, right? Jesus said the prerequisite is you got to know you're a sinner because when you're honest with yourself, then you can take the Savior. And so that's the real danger here when we, when we no longer talk about sin. When the church never talks about sin anymore, people don't know they need a Savior. What Jesus is saying here is that if you don't know you're a sinner before, how will you ever accept the Savior? And that's why our culture that wants to affirm everything, judge nothing, and teach all the kids that everyone's a winner and don't keep score, that's actually dangerous because we keep telling people, especially children, that everything you do is good. It undermines the gospel, and they will be, never be able to see their need for their sins to be forgiven. Did everybody follow? Did people track with me on that? Jesus wasn't a trickster, was he? Jesus wasn't here just to be popular. He, he wasn't in it just to get people to follow him. You know, you tell people what they want to hear, you know what they do? They write bigger checks. Jesus was not there just to tell people what they wanted to hear. He didn't preach an easy message and try to tickle people's ears just to gather a crowd. He just wanted to tell the truth because he loved them. And you know what? Jesus wants you. Are you a follower of Jesus? Every single one of you? He wants you. He wants you and he wants me and he wants our church to do the right thing. He wants us to be like Jesus and tell that truth even when it hurts. Even if it means our hometown tries to throw us off a cliff. I spelled throw T-R-O-U-G-H, but I know better. Uh, whoever said love doesn't hurt anyways, sometimes it hurts to love. Uh, brothers and sisters, let's pray. Dear God, dear Jesus, here we are, and we want to be more like you, Jesus. Help us to really care about people, even when that means tough love, even when that means life is going to go difficult, become difficult for us. And Lord, you know we're messed up ourselves. We struggle with darkness inside of us, with pride and greed and envy and lust and anger and impatience and, and all these nasty things that keep popping up right in our own hearts, Lord. So help us not to be quick to point fingers at other people, Lord, but help us to see our own sin. As we speak bold, unpopular truth, God, help us not to be hypocrites. Help us to be humble and to love other people, even people very different than ourselves, even people who misunderstand us and who think and say all sorts of nasty things about us, Lord. God, help us to bring love. Help us to be blessings wherever we go. Help us to bring the truth to everyone around us. We pray this in your name. Amen. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.